Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Knowledge webinar episode. In this week's episode, introduction to our to oh sorry, in, uh, Rhino sorry, Rhino with V-Ray, engagement ring prototype and render. In this webinar, our presenter Mayam Rav Holtzman will demonstrate the creation of a traditional engagement suite from model to export to render. In particular, she will focus on building organic and geometric structures, applying Pave to those structures, STL creation and development of a high quality final render. And here's the pedigree of today's presenter. Maya runs a series of intensive Rhinoceros 3D workshop at Design Rhino, a Robert McNeil and Associates authorized training center in Los Angeles. A jewelry and industrial designer, Maya employs Rhino 3D modeling to supplement handcraft in her line of limited edition jewelry and works in the luxury goods, industrial and architectural industries as a freelance modeler and renderer. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novag. Novag is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's needs. Come visit us at novage.com and see, you know, for yourselves. And for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novag blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Coming up next week, real-time project collaboration with Bluebeam Studio. Interested in enhanced project collaboration in real time? Earn one AIA learning unit when you join us for this free one-hour AIA CES approved course. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded live. If you want to rewatch this or any webinar episode in our collection, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channel. And now, without further ado, I'm going to pass the screen to Maya. So um, the show will start. There it is. Hi guys, how are you? <laughs> um, I think, can you see my screen, Barbara? Yes, we can. Great. Looks Excellent. great. Awesome. All right. Um, I'm going to just open up, not this one, actually, but this one. Um, interesting. So my um, luck, as it would have it, is that not only have I had to reschedule this webinar twice for various reasons, but that in the past few hours, I had a complete meltdown on my computer. So I've been scrambling to try to um, recreate what I was going to show you guys. and. I think I'm basically there, but if it's not as beautiful as it would have been, I apologize in advance for that. Um, essentially, what I'm doing here is I'm starting out with not that. Something crazy going on with my lovely computer. Um, close, please. Okay. So I'm in my four views here, and I actually have some curves that I've created pulled up, but I'm just going to start um, working in my stone layer and hide all of these curves. And the first thing that I'm going to do, I think I've perhaps done this before in another tutorial, but I'm going to make um, a cutter, which is what I always do for any stone jewelry that I create, even if I'm not cutting seats for the um, piece of jewelry. It just is really useful in many ways to create this cutter because it allows me to scale the stone to size. It allows me to work with it as a smaller number of facets in a poly surface. So in order to do that sort of the most easy way possible, I'm going to go ahead and make a circle by diameter or two-point circle using my mid O snap. Actually, I'm going to use end O snap here because I want it to come from the bottom. And I'm just going to snap from end on one side there to the end on the other side, making sure that I'm actually getting the direct shot here. And holding shift down can help to do that for ortho. So I've just created this circle around the edge, this curve, that defines the diameter of my stone without actually um, using all of these facets that would make a cut or a seed or anything that I do with the stone also faceted. 
I'm going to just change that um, that curve to another color so I can see it. So I'm going to make a new layer. And I'm going to change object layer. Okay. Um, hmm. Apparently I copied one. All right, there I've got one now. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude this to a point. So I'll do extrude curve to point. And let's go into this layer. And I'm going to use my end O snap to snap to the culet of the stone here to make this sort of seat. You can see that the facets of the stone intersect the seat a little bit. That doesn't really matter. I mean, ultimately, whatever we use this for, if we use it to actually cut seats in a piece of jewelry or if we only use it um, to create the seat for a rendering, we're still not going to worry too much if there's intersection. What we never really want to do in jewelry making is make the seat too big. So then the next thing that I'm going to do here is I'll go ahead and I'll extrude the curve or the surface edge, whichever one I want, just straight. I like to do the surface edge generally. I'm going to make sure that both sides is toggled to no and solid equals no so that I'm just making another surface that I can join to that original extrusion. And here I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that it's taller than the table of my stone. It doesn't matter really how high it is because of course the stone table is going to be exposed whenever we place it onto a surface. So I go there, I can select my two surfaces or I could even do SEL, SRF, select surface and control J to join this together. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and cap so that I've created a closed poly surface from this. Um, the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to go into my top view down here in my viewport tabs and I'm just going to go ahead and make another cutter. So I can offset this top edge, offset, use the edge as an offset. I don't even have to create a curve to offset that edge and I'm going to make a cutter that's approximately by eye maybe somewhere between a third and a half of the total diameter of the stone. So I can use the through point option in my offset to decide where I want the offset to go rather than having to pick a value. And I'm going to say probably around where the table, um, the table ends is a good point. So I'll just go ahead and do that. And with that curve now, I can go ahead and extrude, so I'll go into my front view, although it's not necessary, but extrude curve, and then I'm going to do extrude both sides equals yes, and solid equals yes, and now I do really want to be in my front. I want to see that this uh, cutter is going to be long enough for me, so essentially I know I can move it down a bit with my gumball, I'm just going to put it here and then once it's extruded I'll make sure that it's solid, it is, and then I'll go ahead turn my gumball on and move it down here. Okay. Um, that essentially is not necessary for the center stone of this engagement ring. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to copy the stone in place which has already been sized based on the GIA report that I pulled off the internet, you guys can see if you're ever trying to figure out um, what size you'd like to make your stone, you can always go ahead and look for a GIA stone and then scale your stone to meet those values. So actually in this case I think I haven't because I'm looking at the stone. I think this stone is just exactly as it was. So I'm going to show you really quickly how you can scale it if you'd like to do that. Um, but first I'll copy and place, right click over the copy and place command, and then I'll lock that one stone that I copied in place. I'll select the rest of this and just drag it off with my gumball to the side, hitting Alt to make a copy. 
Okay, so now I can delete those. Actually, I didn't need to make a copy. I could just drag it off. Now that I think about it, because I have one there, then unlock. And this is the center stone. So let's hide that. Now for creating or changing the size of this stone, I can look at the top. I know that the values are 9.4, this is a three carat stone, by 9.42 with a height of 5.6 millimeters. So I'm going to go ahead using my curve. I'll do the scale command, which is going to scale the entire thing. And I'll use my quad O snap. Since there are no quads on this faceted stone, it makes it really easy for me to be sure that I'm snapping to the edge of the curve. Quad. Uh, you know what? Let's do it from center so it keeps centered, actually. So let's do center to quad is going to be 9.4 divided by 2. You see I've used the divided option here so that I'm going, I'm scaling it in half of its total diameter. And then for the other scale direction, I'm going to scale it 1D. So instead of doing a full scale, since it's almost nothing, I'm just going to do scale 1D from center. Now we're coming in this direction, quad 9.42 divided by 2 just scales up a tiny bit. And then in our front view here, I can use Smart Track to scale the total um, height of the stone, which I think is 5.6. Yes. So I'm going to do Scale 1D again. I have two of them there. That's interesting. Let's delete one. Scale 1D. Origin point is going to be um, the top of the table here, so I'll just go ahead and using Smart Track, I'm going to find my two end points that are opposite one another, and to end, come back into the middle. It's not liking that. Let's try one more time. The Smart Track tool is really awesome, but occasionally. You really have to fight it. Okay, there we go. And make sure that it turns white. And it's not giving me my point. Let's see. Okay, smart track. Thank you. That's not it. Try one more time here, guys. If it doesn't work, I'll fight. Okay, there we go. So I got my point, which is the dead center of that table. Probably would have been a lot quicker just to make a line at that point. But now I'm going to snap to the end here for my second reference point, and then 5.6. It just scales a little bit, so it's not a big deal. But if you want this to be perfect, that's what you would do. Ah, I see what happened. I didn't move my stone when I did that. Great. Um, the best way for me to do this, and this is kind of a good teaching moment that I use all the time, just so you guys know, is if you do something stupid like I just did where you actually don't move your object and then you've done a bunch of work and you don't feel like repeating it, Control C, copy to clipboard, allows you to copy your object. Then I can undo my work. Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, Control Z. I don't know where this stone is, but let's just go there. All right, so now I can select all to, let's see if I have that. Yep. Okay. Now I have my stone there. I'm going to unlock, delete this, and then Control-V, paste that back in. The work is still done, but I have managed to go back and rescue this piece without having to fight to get it back there. So the next thing that I'm going to do, I have my stone in place. I'm making a center stone 3 carat with a halo of 1 point stone, so 3 millimeter stones all the way around. Um, generally, the way that we want to do something like this is, and I'm just going to actually really quickly place these on the right layer so that they are 
on my cutter layer, change object layer right there. Um, and I can make a new stone layer for this as well. New sub layer, small stone. Okay, and let's just turn that off. All right, so I've actually, because of my weird situation that just happened, I've actually created some curves that we can use to um, build this halo. But what I would normally imagine doing is, if I'm creating my prongs here for the stone, that's the first step that I'm going to do, because I want to see where the edges of my prongs sit after I build them um, so that when I do my halo, I'm not intersecting the prong too much. If I need the prong as support, or if these two objects are actually going to intersect each other and be joined together and cast together, that's great. In this case, they do intersect a bit, um, but I want to see where the intersection ends so that I don't have too much intersection. So this prong curve that I've built, essentially I just built by creating a control point curve. And um, if you want to start at zero, just grid snap, basically. And let's turn off Smart Track. As long as I'm not doing anything weird here, now I can turn grid snap off. It's going to stay planar. And I can just create my curve. Now, once I've got my curve created, and I like the way that it's shaped, um, I will rebuild it, because I basically believe that you should rebuild every curve that you create, even if you keep the same point count. So if I want the point count to remain four and say, okay, it's just going to average out the curvature of this curve to make it a smoother thing to work with. So it's, in my opinion, really important that you do that. Um, you'll have much nicer surfaces that are created as a result. This one was already rebuilt. I'm going to use the pipe command to pipe it, and I'm going to make sure that it's diameter, not radius. I'm going to give this a diameter of one. Um, I've, I've heard a million things, so you never really know, but a lot of people say that 1.2 is kind of a good sized um, prong for a larger stone. That's great. Um, I'm going to I'm going to scale this 1D a little bit so that it's not entirely round. I want it to be a little bit ovoid. So I'm going to make it 1.2, excuse me, in the opposite direction. Right now, making sure that my cap equals round, that'll make it easier when I'm rendering. And if I feel like that's, well, the first thing that I'll do here is I'm just going to go ahead and scale it. So I'll scale from center, basically. Um, or actually, you know what, maybe we can do the gumball. Let's turn it on and see. If I do scale here, 1.2, because this was 1 millimeter and I wanted to scale it to 1.2 millimeters, I just basically typed in 1.2. That's not the distance. I've just scaled it in two directions to 120% of its original size. So slightly different than giving a value for length with my gumball, I can actually just scale this up percentage value. And if it's something as simple as, <coughs> excuse me, something as simple as scaling um, something that started out with a value of 1 or 100, then if I type in 1.2 or 120%, I basically just got the exact value that I wanted to create easily. Um, then in my top view here, I can go ahead and array polar around zero, which is the, where I would always suggest you work around. Number of items for this particular object are going to be four. Hit enter um, and enter again. This is my preview option, which I love in Rhino 5. Go ahead and play with that. You can always update if you want to get six items instead of four and you want to see what your, ob your object is going to look like with six prongs. You might decide you like that. If you don't like it, you can either type in I, which is the items shortcut, keyboard shortcut, or click on it in your clickable options here. <clears throat> Hit enter. And then I'll just do SEL last, select last, and rotate 
my prongs from zero using ortho, so I'll hold shift down, and I have my ortho set to 45 degree angles, so I can just rotate these 45 degrees. If you want to set your ortho to something other than 90, you can right click over the modeling aid pane at the bottom of your screen and go to set ortho angle and change it. So right now it's at 45, I could adjust that to whatever ortho angle I want. And then if I used ortho to rotate this from zero, I would be able to rotate in increments of 10 degrees rather than 45 or 90 or whatever. <clears throat> Um, so I've got my prongs. I'm happy with their size. If you're not happy with their size, absolutely, you know, this is, this is an opinion thing. I have a lot of students who come and ask, like, what is the af actual right way of doing this? I, I suggest, honestly, that you go and take a look at some of the free literature that places like Stuller or Rio hand out if you're interested in seeing the sort of like default values that companies um, use for their settings. I mean there, there are just so many of them. A lot of it has to do with preference, not anything structural. Um, I've seen uh, beading for pave surfaces as small as like 0.4 millimeters cast. I don't necessarily like to go that small because I'm a little terrified of itty bitty parts on things, but it can be done and I would really, I mean, I don't think there's an actual definitive answer. If there is, somebody should type that in on the side and let us all know. I would love to know. But so I hear 1.2 uh, depending on the shape and also if you have double prongs on the side, obviously they can be thinner. Um, so. These are the, my prongs as they're set up now. I'm going to go back into my front view. Notice that I'm typing front in. I'm in that habit. We can always toggle among our tabbed viewport at the bottom there. Um, I'm just in the habit of typing in the word of the viewport, the name of the viewport as I work, partially because it's really easy when you're in the middle of a command to move from viewport to viewport or to recenter yourself. So if I'm here and I start a command, like if I'm going to do sweep two rails, which is actually what I want to do. Sweep two. I select my two rails and then I realize I need to be looking at this from the front view. I can just type in front while I'm working and go ahead and get the view of the front of my object. So I, I use that a lot. Um, my cross-section curves, this is already created. I'm going to hit enter. Um, all of this looks great. Close sweep is the only thing that you would want to check and do not simplify is a great idea um, unless you know that you're going to need to build your object with a poly surface like this you really wouldn't so okay um, and then I'm just going to loft the top I use I generally tend to like using surface edges over curves when they're allowable and then just to make sure because Rhino can do weird things when I get my scene point adjustment option pop up I want to make sure that these are really on the quad here. So they are, I can see that visually by seeing that I'm working around zero and they're on the x-axis, which is great. But if they were slightly off like this and you do your sweep too, what you get is this very ugly um, ISO curve layout that we would always like to avoid. So I'm going to cancel, I'm going to redo edge, edge, Enter. Make sure that those are lined up. They should be. If you if you did something wrong, and when you have a geometric symmetrical structure like this, that's when you'll get these sort of off of their off of like a, a good spot. But if I hit enter here and look in my top view, make sure that everything is set out nicely. Say okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my surface and my poly surface and control J to join those together. Um, these guys now become the basis for my halo and you can see that there's an intersection here with the prongs. It's not a problem for me. Um, if it's a problem for you, you, don't, you can adjust the size of this. Um, so the next thing that I want to do here is I'm going to create a channel for my 
stones to sit in. And the way that I'm going to do that in this case is by doing the offset curve on surf command. And I'm in my top view here. I'm looking at my object. I'm going to grab my poly surface edge. If you grab the curve, Rhino prompts you to tell it in which direction you would like to do the offset. If you grab the poly surface edge, you can see right now that I have my preview pink color, which is always the preview color by default. If I go in my selection menu between the two different directions that this edge could go in, I'm going to offset based on where my the normal arrows are heading. So see that they're going along the top of the surface there. I'm going to just go ahead and flip. And then I'll give an offset distance of 0.25 and hit enter. That may be a little bit thin, but that's what we're going with for this particular demo. Poly surface edge again. I'm going to flip it. You can see that the flip option is there. You can just type the letter F in your keyboard shortcut for that. And then you make sure that your offset distance, I don't have to re input it because it's in. Um, carrots right here, I just hit enter, and you can see that I've created two offset curves. All right, so I'm going to place my um, halo to be on the blue layer here. I'm going to do change object layer, and I'll go ahead and with these curves, I'm going to cut myself a little area where then I can go ahead and do a seat. So I'll do the extract surf command. Make sure that copy equals yes. So I'm going to hit C so that copy goes to yes. Extract the proper surface, neither of those. So make sure you try to grab on the ISO curves. Hit enter. And then I can, since I already have, I could basically do trim or split, but I'm going to go ahead and do the trim command using my two curves so that I get rid of those two excess pieces. Trim my little propeller, or you can type it in. Select object, I'm going to get my surface, and then select object again, not that one, so I'm going to undo it. Surface, enter. Notice that I still have a full poly surface, no naked edges, and now I have my smaller surface here that is going to become my cutter. Um, the next thing I'll do here is I'll offset surf. Since it's a single surface, we have the both sides option, which is great, so I'm going to use that. Um, it's not necessary, but sometimes with the Boolean operations, Rhino doesn't like it when two surfaces are sharing the exact same place, um, so or they're sharing the exact same space in the scene. So if I do the offset in both directions, I find that I have a tendency of having a better chance of the Boolean difference working here. So I'm going to make my distance 0.35 and hit enter. Make sure that solid equals yes also. It does. And we can see that my cutter has gone in two directions, right? One and two. And now I'm going to go ahead and do the Boolean difference command. Subtracting from my main poly surface, that's going to be my halo, with the cutter that I just created. For this exercise, I'm going to say delete input yes, because I want this to be as clean as possible and I don't want to see that. But in general, I suggest never um, deleting anything until you're done and you know that you're not going to need it anymore. Because in my experience, there are always things that show up in life that you realize you or that you throw away in life and right knowing that you realize later on you might like to have had. So I just hide everything. My analogy is that there, we have our hide objects icon here at the top. This is like your junk closet. You can just throw stuff back in there and then if you need it you can go into your show selected objects. Um, I don't have any hidden objects but I can hide a couple of things like that, and then I can go into show selected objects. It's like, oops, let me do that. Show selected, and it's like my closet with my skis in it and my brooms and stuff. Things that like I might want to grab once in a while. Like I pull that guy back. I can leave everything else in there until I'm absolutely certain I don't need it. 
my layers I can turn on and off, but these are much more organized. I consider those like my shoe closet, so I want to keep them nice and neat um, as much as I possibly can. So this is now my beginning of making this halo setting. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the top view and I'm going to turn my small stone back on right here and I'm going to turn on my cutter that I created for the small stone. I know that these stones need to be um, three millimeter stones because or more or less three millimeter stones because that's the size of a one point stone and there's obviously going to be a little bit of clay in all melee stones so just keep in mind that that's um, you know it could be 2.97 or 2.95 or 3.505 or whatever um, clearly right now it is not the right size so right now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make a circle here by two points again circle two points and I'm going to use this edge that's here um, from end to end to make my first circle now I already know actually I can do the diameter here 3.043 that's good actually because I want it to be a little bigger than the actual stone size um, I already know how many stones I can fit into this area in a sort of edge-to-edge -edge way. So I'm going to extract, but I'm going to show you how I would figure it out um, if I didn't know. So I'm going to extract ISO an ISO curve from my poly surface. Again, using the edge here, I can use my mid O snap. Okay, awesome. Enter. I have my mid O snap there, and then I can array curve this one. This is my path curve. Um, I can change the number of items and I can type in 14 and we can see how that looks. Say OK. So here 14 is actually a bit big. And the reason that it's a bit big is because I, um, I did the seat here. I was playing around earlier with trying to figure out this value. I did the seat and it was a little bit deeper before and I felt that it was too deep for this stone, I did it at 0.5. So now these are going to be a bit smaller. So let's offset this curve in the top view, um, 0.1. And let's do 0.05 actually. Okay. Now I'm going to just delete that and I'll just do array curve again, or it could be actually a ray polar at this point. Let's do a ray polar around zero, number of items 14. Okay, so that's good. So um, I'm just going to escape there. I'm going to undo, 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 offset. Apparently I have two of them there because they arrayed around. Okay, let's delete these both. And then I'm going to find the diameter of this 2.944. Okay, so I know that um, 2.944 is the diameter of that curve, and that if I do array polar around 0 14 times I'm going to get stones that are positioned close enough to one another that it gives a little bit of play for size but it also I mean another thing that any jeweler could feel free to correct me on if they think that this is not the case but I've had it on from people who I really do respect enormously um, that these Pavade stones should really touch each other edge to edge. I mean, you shouldn't. I've, I had originally been taught that you should leave some space like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 millimeters in between, which we actually probably have here right now. But I've been corrected on that a couple of times by people who do amazing work, and they say ideally you really want these to be girdle to girdle. So 
Um, that's what I go with now, and I also make a habit of always asking the person who's going to be setting my stones for me what he or she prefers. So let's go ahead and scale this down. You can see now how easy it is to get this to the right size. I do scale. That's scale 3D from quad to quad. In this case, it doesn't matter. Quad. Let's find the quad. So I just right clicked over. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but 2.94, let's just say. Um, I just right clicked over quad. That turns off all the other selected O snaps. It also works for my filter tool. So if I right click over points, everything goes away. If I want to bring everything back, I just right click over points again and it brings it all back. Same thing here. If I right clicked on quad and I got rid of mid and end and now I want them to come back, rather than having to laboriously click one and another, I can just right click to get rid of them so that they don't interfere with my modeling process and then right click again to bring them back. All right. In my top view now, um, I'm going to make a copy of this just in order for me to create my beads. Now, again, a lot of people, um, well, there's an ongoing conversation, right? Like the traditional jeweler who probably doesn't ever use 3D modeling anyway, um, would not ever cast beads into a pave surface. They would pull the beads up with a graver. So um, doing this and casting in beads is the shortcut. It can look really great though, guys. So I mean, I, I have a tendency to love the traditional, but at the same time, it, it's very labor intensive. So to make our lives easier, let's go ahead and create these beads. I'm going to do the copy command. And I'm going to copy from quad to quad. If I ever am worried about making sure that I can copy here and I'm hitting a bunch of stuff, I can turn on um, project after I find my first point, and that will ensure quad. Now I turn on project. It will ensure that I, even if I snap to the wrong quad here, it's going to keep itself planar to the original point that I chose. So these guys are going to, oh, and maybe not. Let's try that again. Hmm. Well, that's a lie. So let's turn off project and do it like this. And I will let you guys know how that works, but it should work like that. It's very strange. Um, usually, oh, I know why. Actually, I'm just going to show you. Planar is off. I usually work with planar on. So I'm going to do the copy command one more time. Select my objects from quad. Then I choose project. Now, even if I snap to the wrong quad, which is that one, right, it's still going to pop up to the exact same point in the plane that I originally chose my moving um, point from. So here I am in my top view now. And I know that I need to make prongs that are, at, in this case, I'm going to make two. I have a smaller size here and a larger size here. Um, these I'm going to do, um, I think I'm going to do them 0.9 and these I'm going to do 0.75. So what I need to do is I need to do a circle, tangent, tangent, radius. So I go into my circle command, I select tangent, and I'm going to find my two tangent points. So make sure project is off now because we don't want it to get in the way. And we only want near if anything. Let's just find that and that. Okay, those are my two tangent points. And then radius. And for the radius, I'm going to type in 0.9. Enter. Top view. Ah, radius should not be 0.9. Radius should be 0.45. This is what happens when you lost your notes. <laughs> Circle. One thing about this that's annoying is that when you re-engage the command for the circle command or other commands like that, um, it doesn't remember if you chose a clickable option. So you can't re-engage by, by hitting enter. You actually have to reselect. So tangent, tangent, radius, 0.45. Okay. And then I'm going to do on the other side, same thing, tangent, tangent, radius.
And for my radius, I know that I want it to be, um, I want my diameter to be 0.75, so I'm going to do 0.75 divided by 2 just for the sake of being 0.75 divided by 2. Okay, and then in my top view, I can take a look. So this one is slightly larger than that one. And now I know that I need to make a line that I'm going to use as a, a structural element for creating a prong. So I'm going to do that line from center in the front view, both sides. So I'll find my center O snap, both sides. I type in B. This is an eyeing it out kind of thing, guys. Um, I want it to be more or less as high as the top of the table. Because the girdle is going to be sitting in the, in the material, I don't care how deep it goes as long as it's deep enough to be boomed into the, the uh, seat there. So something like this is probably great because I'm going to be putting caps on it. Um, I'm going to then move this or copy it from center to center. So I have two. And then I'm going to pipe them both. So I'll do pipe. This one is going to be a diameter of 0.9. This one is going to be a diameter of 0.75. Okay, cool. So now I can get rid of this. I don't need it anymore. Uh, oh, actually, let's not. Go into my top view. I want these to be intersecting my stones a bit. So I'm going to move this in using my nudge keys. I just moved it 0.1 millimeters. I'm, let's move it 0.15. Um, same thing with this guy. 0.15. Okay. Now I can get rid of that cutter. It is no longer necessary. Um, I'm going to do orient on surf now for this. And I'm going to do orient on surf with a rotation. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I have, like, well, we had discussed that this webinar would go for an hour and a half. I'm hoping that you guys can stick around for it because there's a whole V-Ray section. But if not, um, it's going to be recorded. I'm going to finish up this portion of it, and then I'm going to go into V-Ray because um, I see that my time has already gone long. And um, I'll just turn on my other elements, or I can actually show you really quickly, but I won't go through the entire process. But this is super important for paving surfaces. This works with multiple sizes of stones, and it adjusts the prongs if necessary. Uh, I think it's really fantastic. So um, without having to use a design software, you can actually do it like this. I'm going to hide my ISO curve that I grabbed there, and I'm just going to go ahead and do the Orient on surf command in perspective. I suggest you always use perspective for orient on surf. It makes your life a million times easier because you remember exactly the order of operations. It's one of the most sort of like operation intensive commands that there is. So we're going to do orient on surf. Base point, I'm going to use my center O snap. I'm going to find the center of the bottom of the cutter where the girdle is. Okay. Reference point for scaling rotation, always just drag up along Y. I usually try to do about the same distance as the entire um, diameter or size of the object. So somewhere around there, left click again, surface to orient on, making sure that I'm grabbing my ISO curve so I don't have to do it more than once. I now have this option of scale and rotation. So for multiple sizes of stones with Pave, I will have, sorry, I'll have my um, circles already laid out like you would do on a regular pavade surface if you were doing it by hand. Um, and then if I'm going to use the scale command, I can prompt the scale. In this case, they're all the same size. I don't need to, but let's just go ahead and take a look and see how it would work. Um, rotation prompt also because obviously this is not going straight in a row, so we need to rotate. I'm going to say OK. Um, I'm going to find the center here. OK of my object. And for this, oh, you know what? I didn't do it right. So I'll just show you really quickly anyway. Um, in order for this, you know what? Let me just do it one more time, guys. Sorry. Base point, 
center. And now for my reference for scaling, I need to actually find the quad point here on the side because that's going to be the scaling size. There we go. Surface to orient on. Okay. I'm going to find the center now. I want to make sure that only center's on first. Center and then quad. Okay, so I've just found the quad point, and you can see that it's snapping right into size there based on that circle. So center, if you have to do it a different way, that's fine. And then I'm going to use the center O-snap here. Let's see if I did it wrong, you guys. Oh, I did it wrong. I'm the worst. So normally the center O-snap would go out and find the thing one last time. Center, quad, it really does work very well. Okay, center, quad. Now I find the center of my next stone, okay? And I place it, and you see how it lines up exactly right. Now this one is enormous. It's not the right size. You can see that my prongs are out too far. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and redo one last time, just to be super annoying. Center, quad, surface to orient on, poly surface, okay, center, I need to make sure that I'm finding the right quad point. So of course it's not working. There we go. Okay, quad, center. All right. So that's what it should look like. And if I do, sorry for the very, very long delay. If I do an entire grouping of these over and over again, I just keep on going center, quad, find the center of the next stone, center, quad, find the center of the next stone. Now how do you do that? Well, when you do it, you make sure that whatever, I'm just going to do this, whatever, uh, I'm sorry. You get the prompt to say copy and that will make you, it will allow you to make multiple copies until you're done. So I'm going to select these all right now if I can without doing that. I'm going to control G to group them and I'm going to array these guys polar around zero, number of items 14. And they all set themselves up really beautifully with their um, prongs or whatever you want to call them. Now these are really high, okay? So another nice thing that you can do here is when you do your array polar, you can use record history. And then whatever you do to one of them will happen to all of them. So it'll allow you a lot of leeway for working on these guys. Um, if you need to move your, like if you need, to, for example, to make your beading or prong smaller, you can do that really easily by just selecting the parent object. Um, I'm going to ungroup. I can select this poly surface. Let's turn my gumball on. Let's see if it's aligned to object. It won't want aligned to object. I'm going to do it myself. All right, so we're going to go ahead and relocate gumball center to end. Sorry guys. There we go. 
So hopefully this is the parent object, actually, because it might not be based on everything else that's going on right now. But I, if I go like that, it's not the parent object. Control D. I'm just going to select a child object, and it will show me which one the parent is. All right, I'm aligning to... the object. Now if I update this, if I move this anywhere, all my other objects will move along with it. So I can adjust it to put it where I think it should be. Also, um, for rendering, you will want to have these smaller than you will for rapid prototyping. So you need to have the sense of being able to do both. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, rapid prototype really quick, just the meshing stuff, and then I'm going to move into the V-Ray section here. So let's go ahead and say, all right, this is great. I'm also going to turn on my shank, um, which should have pavade stones on the side, but we're not going to have time for that. Um, basically what happens here is that I'm going to use my cutters, the green guys, to cut through my object. I have, and these are going to create like round holes. They're not really nice azures. If you want to cut your own azures, it's nice to have guide holes. Also, you can create cutters, the long cutters that are going to go all the way through that are square or any di design that you like. So if you want them to be like a diamond, you can do that as well. Um, but for now, we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and select this and do the Boolean difference. Um, I have delete input there. I'm going to go ahead and select my cutters by right clicking over that layer, select objects. Those are my objects to subtract with. Mine is going to work for a moment. Hopefully my computer won't crash. Ah, oh, it doesn't work. Great. All right. So occasionally, again, sometimes these things um, don't work the way you want them to. I always find that this is a really good learning tool, but obviously it's better when we're not short on time. So I'm going to turn off my stones, and I'm going to turn off my shank. And I'm going to turn off my prongs of all varieties. OK. And oh, that's point one. All right. And I'm going to select, let's see, which is, let's just lock that. I'll select half of these and see if that's a problem there. And if it is, it may be that they all need to be ungrouped, which is occasionally also the case. So let's just go ahead and do this. Select objects. Are they grouped? Yeah. OK. So I'm just going to select objects, ungroup. Um, now I'll try it again, and let's see what happens. I mean, difference. Select objects to subtract with my cutters. Enter. It failed again. Yay. All right. So now is the annoying moment when in life you have to just pick them one by one. Escape. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and move these out so that they're not a child of the stones anymore. So I can turn the stones off. All right, and I'm just going to see 
what layer these guys are on. Layer 6, let's turn layer 6 on also. Now, okay. It's completely failing. Sorry guys, this is not fun. Okay. So one of these is not is probably sharing an edge. And unfortunately we have to do it manually until we figure out which one it is. I'm gonna grab a few just because. Thank you, Maya, for uh, wow for it, you know, <laughs> keeping the cool. And actually people are, people feedback is that they're actually picking up a few tricks. So duress sometimes, right. uh, you know, brings out the best instinct. So thank you again. <laughs> thank you again. And I okay. think it's yeah. very helpful. Yeah, I'm sorry because this is really not what I need to be doing right now. I need to go into, um, into the V-Ray section. I'm so annoyed, you guys. I'm sorry. So this guy right here is probably what's causing the problem where the edges looks like. So I'm just going to see if I can't. So shared edges, again, are part of the problem a lot of the time when we're doing this. But there are some a number of these that are failing, so I don't really know why. If I can get a quarter of this piece here, I can trick Rhino. Let's just try this. This is actually also a pretty good tool. All right. So here I am, right? This one doesn't work. Um, if I have something like this where I can cut two sections from it and I'm fighting with the Boolean command, we always have this option of extracting an ISO curve. Actually, I won't be able to do it like that. I'm going to just do two lines because it's a poly surface. Now, hopefully. Uh, no, because I don't have the right number of them. Uh, mirror. Okay. I'm mirroring across the two directions. Close poly. That's great. Unlike everything else that's been going on right now. All right, um, I'm going to turn the stones on, and I'm going to turn all this stuff on. Um, I don't, I'm terrified to even know what happens if I Boolean union off this. But so let me go ahead, you guys. I think ideally what's going to happen right now is that I'm going to go into um, the V-Ray portion because I know you all want to see that, and it's really important and cool. Um, we have our objects booleaned here. I can just do um, a little bit of filleting the edges if I want to, just to make it slightly nicer. Or I can do this really awesome command in Rhino um, in our render tools. It's called Apply Edge Softening. It allows you to essentially fillet the display mesh or the render mesh without using the fillet command so you can keep your edges. And if I select my object to apply edge softening to, I have to make it small enough so that it actually allows me to do it. Let's see if that'll work. But when I, so 16% were not softened because the radius is too large. But if I look at this in my rendered view now, 
you can see that I've rounded out my edges here without having to go through the annoying process of filleting each edge. And I really do suggest that for a couple of reasons. One of which is that um, you probably want to keep your edges when you're doing your rapid prototype just for the sake of um, being having the right amount of material to polish away. If you look fill it first, you may end up with really too much of a fillet after you do your polishing. Um, so I'm going to actually undo that for now. Remove all is the way that you do that. And let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on here first because I have two sets of these and I don't know which is which. All right, so hide you and you. And you, and you. All right, so I'm going to go into my perspective view. And I'm going to put this on its side essentially so that it's a nicer um, a nicer render except I need to be able to grab everything alright now I'm going to look at my object in the right view what I generally like to do is I like to make sure that the point here and the point here are touching what will be the floor. So it doesn't have to be entirely 100% perfect, perfect, but you don't want them to intersect with your ground plane because it's obvious. And that's pretty good. I'm just going to relocate my gumball now, and that'll allow me to go from my end here to my end there, more or less, and then. Fine. Actually, I'll rotate. Okay. I'm going to select those curves and hide them, whatever they are. Perspective. Okay. So I can change this shape of my viewport now. So if I want this viewport to be smaller, I can actually change it and make it so that it's a slightly different, um, where I can decide what I want it to look like. I'm going to do SEL, CRV, and grab all my curves and just hide them temporarily so we don't see those. Um, one other thing which I didn't do and we should have done but because I'm racing trying to get all of this stuff done is that when I'm working on a render I will bend my prongs okay um, a lot of people just render the prongs in place I really like bending them into shape um, probably because I don't have to, well I have some time all right I'm gonna select this really quick quickly copy the clipboard and then undo my move for one sec so I can show you what that bend looks like. Essentially what I would do here, I'm not going to be able to grab those, let's do that. I'll re-rotate these so that they're at 90 degrees or so that they're running along 0 and 180 and um, 90 and 270. So I'll just do a rotation. 45 um, and then in my front view I don't need to do all of them I can just do one I'll do the bend command somewhere around here to somewhere around here this one is a little bit long So when you do this, I mean this is even maybe a little bit too, it was a little too long to begin with, but it does give you 
the ability to make your render look a lot more like an actual um, finished piece of jewelry. When we leave our prongs sticking up like this, it doesn't, it looks like a render, no matter what else you do and no matter how fancy your techniques are for rendering the object. So this is one way of doing that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and undo. Um, control A, hide, and then Control V. I'll just paste it back in so that it's already positioned where it was supposed to be. Okay. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you guys is thanks to Fernando who couldn't come today because he's off on a fun excursion. But um, the Really, I mean, the quality of these is just incredible. So what I did right now is I have the V-Ray Express toolbar. Um, you can use the V-Ray Express toolbar in conjunction with other things, with regular V-Ray rendering, to get in, a, like super amazing results. So I'm going to go into my four views really quickly. The first thing that was great for me to learn that I didn't know is that when we create a studio floor in V-Ray, if we're using a studio floor and it's enormous like this, um, it will will lose a ton of information from the HDRI file, the environment, or whatever we're using to illuminate our scene. So in order for us to get a good result, we actually need to um, make sure that our studio floor is as small as it can be without going without us seeing the edges of it. So in this case, I'm here. Let's select this. I know that I want my perspective view to look something like that. So now I'm just going to pull the edges out until I can't see past the edges. Something like that. Okay. And then I'll go into my um, V-Ray materials, and there are all these icons here that allow me to change color. I'm just going to apply a material to the floor temporarily. That is like a grayish material. Um, the other thing that I can do, oh, it's still sticking out of it. Let's see if I drag it back. Okay. Um, the other thing that I can do here is I can go into my V-Ray uh, options here. The first thing that I can do is I can set my um, V-Ray output. So I'm going to go ahead and get my view aspect. That's 1.77. So if I like this shape that I've created in here, I can get the aspect ratio of this viewport and lock that into place and now when I work I can lock my renders into this size so now let's just say that I want my width to be 800 it's going to hopefully update itself um, and then I can go ahead and just take a look at what my render looks like so I'll just hit render really quick So, as you can see, my computer is really struggling. It's been a horrible computer day. Um, it's, this should render in like five seconds. So I have like some crazy weird virus going on. But I'm going to go ahead and show you guys now how to make the materials that we'll use to render out this object. Um, it's really amazing, actually. I'm, I think it's just fantastic. The, I'm going to close this for now. Let's go into our material editor. Um, materials are right here. Um, I have this one material that I added from my V-Ray Express toolbar. I'm going to right click to create a material. And you can see that I have the option of creating a standard material or any number of different materials. In this case we're going to do a standard material. I'm going to rename it. Um, gold. And say OK. Oops. and say OK. And then the really cool thing that um, Fernando taught me to do is I can go ahead under gold and I can create a layer. And often this 
what I didn't realize before is that V-Ray layers are kind of like Photoshop's layers. They're all on top of each other, so you can't see one below if this one is blocking this one or something. In this case, we're going to create a V-Ray VRDF layer, which is a layer that has a bunch of options baked into it. And you can see now if I open up my gold layer, I have diffuse and VRDF. I'm actually going to delete the diffuse layer. By right clicking over it. So I just have my VRDF layer. Um, if you're looking for the um, if you're looking for the a way to make a good gold color, you'll go on the internet and you're gonna find an image of gold. So if you look up gold, okay, crazy. Sorry guys. You'll see that in every single image of gold, you find the color that you like, but you have like a dark tone and the light tone. And we're going to want to get both. I found that in Photoshop, oops, I was able to get a really good result um, by using my eyedropper, bringing in a piece of gold from whatever color of yellow gold I particularly like. It's every company has their own and using my eyedropper to find my diffuse color and my reflection color. So for diffuse, I'm going in and it's going to be the darker color. I'm going to click here and I know my values already. So it's going to be 40 for hue. Saturation is going to be 170 and value is going to be 61. And that's going to be my darker color. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and go into my reflection layer, just looking for the values, and do 47 for the hue, 93 for the saturation, and 241 for the value. Let's say OK. Um, and then I can just go ahead and preview those if my computer will process them. Um, so for any of these images, so now we have like a kind of plasticky color with a light value and a dark value. Um, this is going to be the same for creating silver. It's going to be the same for creating chrome or platinum. Fernando mentioned to me that when he's creating silver, the reflective color has some coppery elements to it. So go online and find your, your metals, and that's going to help you. Here I'm going to also change my reflective glossiness to 0.85, and I'm going to unlock my Fresnel reflections. These are basically keyed in to um, my refraction layer, but we're not using the refraction layer because we're not making a glassy material. So I'm going to unlink those. I'm going to change my Fresnel IOR, index of refractivity, to 25. And then I'm going to preview that. So you can see that we've, we've started to create a much more metallic image using that high Fresnel IOR. And the reflective glossiness, by taking it down a bit, we're scuffing up the material a little. In another moment, I would love to also show you guys about how to put in a bump map, which is one of the reasons why we like the BRDF. I can add a bump map to this with scratchiness that gives a real quality of uh, metal being scratched up, which all polished metal is very finely. So now I'm going to go ahead and add one more layer. And that's going to be a reflection layer. And basically the reflection layer is supposed to hmm, Well, 
yeah, there we go. Sorry. What the reflection layer does is it adds like another level of sort of a gloss coat, clear gloss coat over the metal material. So I'm going to go ahead and apply that to my objects. Let's open that back up again. So I'm going to select everything except the stones. Close this out. Lock my stones and lock my small stones. And I'm going to apply this material by right clicking and going to apply material to selection. Okay. Um, and actually, I need to get my prongs also. I don't know what they're on. Whoops. It's one of those days, guys. Sorry. Those are on that one. Prongs are unlocked. So apply material to selection again, All right? And now let's go ahead and hit render. Um, we can just take a look at it. we can already see even with like the very basic um, HDRI file that's like the sort of default in this software, the Rhino HDRI file, that if ever this would resolve, <laughs> that you're getting a really great gold result immediately. Okay. Um, so because my computer is having all these issues, I'm going to stop doing this and while I answer questions, like 10 minutes. Um, I'll just go ahead and finish up what you guys need for this scene right now. Um, so for the stones, let's go into our gemstones. Let's close out that and that. Um, we're going to create the same material, um, but the same kind of material, but we're going to go back to the default settings. So I'm going to do a new material, standard, and then let's call that Stones. And then I'm going to create a layer, again, VRDF. We can open it up with this little guy right here. And we're going to go ahead and make our, get rid of this diffuse layer, I think. Remove layer. Yes. Okay, so diffuse layer is going to be black here. I'll just select that, and reflection layer is going to be white. We're going to say okay and okay, and we're going to go ahead and we see that we have that. Now we're going to go into our refractions, which we didn't use last time. We're going to make that white as well. Let's say okay and preview. Okay, and so we have what is basically a glassy color object. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to change some of the elements of this. For one, we're going to change this by adding the option of dispersion. And here we have the dispersion option here next to it, which is at 50. And we got really good results at 20, so I'm just going to take that value down to 20. That's just going to allow color to pass through um, the 
you can see already that we've updated and there's color coming through, which is how diamonds actually um, process light as opposed to just being clear. And then um, there's this other element here. Um, where are we? Which is our max depth option in the refractions. This is like how many layers of refractivity Rhino is going to process through. Um, it is a great thing to be able to use if you can. Oh, we need to change our IOR to 2.47 as well. And um, that's our index of refractivity again. And then if we do max depth and we make it any higher, my computer it might actually explode. So I'm not going to change that. But just know that you actually can change it. Um, so we're going to go ahead and now just take a tiny peek at this rendered again, just so we can see what happens to this object. Wow, it looks already stunning. Yeah, no, it, it looks, I mean, it looks totally, oh, but I have to, you guys, whoops, sorry. It does look really stunning. It has to be, um, I have to apply my material to the objects which are locked. So I've selected all of those and now I'm going to apply material to selection. They turn black, but they should render as clear, assuming that I totally didn't mess up the input. don't think that I did. Um, yeah, and the, the, actually, the results here are totally incredible. I'm blown away by how, 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 how realistic this can be made to look. It's, you can basically make jewelry that you can't tell the difference with. Um, so this is the the two elements for creating these objects and now it's going to have to render. Now the final element here that's going to make it look really fantastic and of course because of this problem that I'm having everything is going super duper slow but the final, but you can start to see the stone, right? The final element that's going to make this look absolutely amazing is the environment, and there are a couple of different ways to set the environment up. Um, I know we're like I have until 1:30 basically, and I would like to answer questions, but I have a feeling that it might be a better plan to do the environment so that it's recorded, and then we c I can answer the questions this afternoon um, and send them out. That's up to you, Barbara. Sure, there's a few questions. Just uh, I can talk to you. For a second, you're using V-Ray 2.0, right? Not the V-Ray light. Yes, V-Ray 2.0. Okay, and the other question was, so when you were working in Rhino, Rhino saves everything. You don't have to keep saving. What does that mean? Throughout, Can you repeat the question? Yes. So um, does Rhino automatically save? So you didn't, it didn't you look like you saved. your preferences. For, okay. In Rhino, you can set your preferences for automatic saving. Um, I don't automatically save everything. I've gotten into the habit of saving for myself. Look how pretty this looks without even an envi the environment in there. Um, I've gotten into the habit of saving everything myself rather than letting Rhino do it because I don't want it to stop my work at a point that I'm not ready for things to be saved. So there are a couple of really amazing elements, one of which is the um, in Rhino, I think we can pull it down here, we have the incremental save. Incremental save saves your file in increments of new numbered values. So you save your file with a name and then every time you click on incremental save, it'll save your file as the name of the file plus 001, 002, 003, et cetera, et cetera. So when I'm working, I'm constantly doing incremental saves and that allows me not to have my preferences set um, to save, um, to just letting Rhino choose the saving points because that for me is not a, a really healthy way to work. But if you want to, you can go into your back end, into your options and you can change how often Rhino does its saving 
and you can you can allow Reiner to save for you for sure. Okay, no, that's a great tip. Okay, go ahead, and you can. Are there other questions or? Um, yeah, there's a um, so so somebody said can V-Ray be used outside of Rhino as a standalone render application? Well, yes, I mean V-Ray is okay. an application yeah, that works with a yeah. number of different 3D yeah. modeling softwares, yeah. but it has to be used in con in in con. I'm losing my words. It's been a long day. It has to be used in, in, with another three with a 3D modeling software. It doesn't work on its own completely. Okay, and um, uh, so another question is: um, Is it possible to write the values of the colors? To can you repeat that? Is it possible to write the values of the colors? I to write them down. Yeah, absolutely for the gold values. Yes, yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, where can we get those uh, studio floor types? Okay, so the studio floors, everything that you see here is downloadable from the Chaos Group website um, in the V-Ray toolbar section. So you have to actually have V-Ray, you have to have purchased it, and when you have the, the serial number for your V-Ray, you can log in and become a member of the V-Ray community and then you have all these downloads available, including this awesome toolbar that allows you to really like jump around quickly problems that you would otherwise have to work really hard to do. Hey Maya, so Hello. yeah, no, great, no, that's it. So okay. if you want to keep um, finishing. Right. In my last four minutes, let me see if I can yes. just put in a, the, um, the uh, HGRI environment. There are a couple of things that we can do. I'm not going to do the one way that I was hoping to do, and again, you guys, I really apologize because this could have been a lot better. <laughs> I've not lost my notes in my file to begin with. But um, so if we're going into our V-Ray options again, we go to environment here. Um, we have already the V-Ray HDRI maps in the back end. So if I click on this and I preview, this is already the Rhino default. It's kind of like a Rhino Studio file. Okay, cancel. Um, so I'm just going to actually turn that one off. And I'm going to go in here to the background. And I'm going to change this. I'm going to look for one that Fernando was so nice to give to me. And at the end of this, you guys, I'm going to set up a studio with this stuff in it so that you can actually just throw your jewelry in and um, let's just see if I can, we'll see how this looks as it is. Um, so that you can just throw your jewelry in and hit render and it will work. Um, I'm going to turn this up. This is, takes a little bit of playing around with, unfortunately. I'm just going to re-render if possible. Um, so I've just changed this. Um, to a different HDRI file. The file actually looks like, let's see if we can find it. So it's darkening down a little. But you'll see that the stones and the gold, well they should, um, are going to start to become even more photorealistic. These are what these studios look like. I just used this one, light tent. It's actually, uh, I can't pull it up, but it's actually a series of lights and darks that create the feeling of being inside a lighting studio. Um, that will come in included with what I have online for you guys and I'll have it probably um, in the next day or two when I do the questions. We'll have a link to all of this plus the metals that I created and the stones that I created in the software and um, and uh, everything that you'll need to just sort of throw your own object in and get it to render by applying materials. Another thing to note in the stone material, this one is a little lightened up now, so it's too high of a value. Um, I'm going to stop rendering. Um, the other thing to note is that um, 
is that, um, let's just go in here, sorry. If I wanted to go into my material editor and I want to make a copy of the stones layer, I can duplicate that material it's called stones one or whatever. Um, this material here right now, um, I can actually change the color of the object um, rather than uh, rather than only having a diamond, I can change my object color to make it into other kinds of stones that have a similar kind of value of refractivity and stuff. So it's got really, really dark. So we would have to lighten it up, but you can see that by adjusting the refraction element here um, in that part of the V-Ray BRDF, I can actually make um, a ruby that is going to render, you know, like a also like a, a gemstone. You can see that this one is probably better. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the webinar. I'm going to answer questions. I'm going to give you guys um, all a file containing all of the elements that I think you'll need in order to get your jewelry to look amazing. If you have questions, I'm really, really, really so sad and sorry about the fact that this was so disorganized. I apologize. Um, Barbara and I have officially decided that the webinar was jinxed, so there's that. Um, but if you need anything at all from me, um, I'm always here to answer questions of any of you, so shoot me an email. Um, my website is designrhino.nyc.com, or you can find it. The link, I think, is in my bio. If not, just look for it. Um, you can shoot me an email through that web page. I have a ton of jewelry specific information that I'd be happy to share with everyone. I think the jewelry industry is very closed and I'm in the process of trying to open it up a little bit. So let's try to share and I'll get better as a result. Um, and thank you guys for hanging out and watching us. Yeah, thank you, Maya. The, the, we've had great feedback throughout the webinar. A lot of support. Uh, somebody's questioned the fact that you're human. I, and I say you're superhuman. And that's the proof. <laughs> Keeping your cool like that when the computers are exploding. And it, I know it's not easy. <laughs> so there's uh, somebody that says, um, uh, I left uh, the, the webinar for a second and I, I missed where I, I would be able to find the files for the environment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have a, a set of files for the environment. So anyone who needs those files will be able to go to Noveg and find the download link in like a day or two. I'm gonna have it in Dropbox, but it'll be um, with all the answers to the questions that I need to, if I need to answer questions, or somehow the people at Noveg will have it attached to this webinar. Yes, somehow. Or yes, find out we'll find a way. Person. We will find the way, so stay, stay tuned. Okay, now, thank you, that's, uh, oh, somebody wants your email one more time so they can tattoo them okay. on their body. So you can either email design rhino nyc, like New York City, um, dot com, my, sorry, that's my website. Design rhino nyc dot com is my website. I think my email for that Website address is Maya M A I A at designrhino.nyc.com, or you could conversely just email my entire name Maya Marav Holtzman at gmail.com. I'm happy that's my personal email. Just send it over there. Whatever you like. You you you'll find her if they want to find you. They will. I'm confident. You find me. I'm a, I'm around. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, the, by the way, the rendering was spectacular. I am sorry. I have to switch screen. Sorry. I'm so, I'm so bummed, but thank you for sticking it out, those of you who did, and I hope that it's useful. And I, I will be glad to do like a written sort of explanation of how to get the environment to work properly. That that's a great idea. I yeah. you know, we'll talk about it. That's fantastic. I wanna thank everybody for attending. It was a roller coaster, but it was well worth it. Great tips. And visit Design Rhino, find Maya and her great work. Um, and also visit our webpage on and check. We have 
both Rhino and V-Ray. So Novaj is the best way to buy design software online. It's a one shop stop, one stop shop. Uh, for information on the latest specials and new releases, join the Novaj network on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. And uh, I want to remind everybody the coming webinar will be real time project collaboration with Bluebeam Studio. And um, also want to remind everybody that our webinar is being recorded and to watch it again, you can check our YouTube and video and Vimeo channel uh, as early as this evening. It will all be up and uh, you can watch it over and over again. Thank you so much, Maya, and thank everybody for attending. Have a great rest of the day. And a deserved hot bath or chilled beer, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> Bye, Maya. Bye, Barbara. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.